And I think, you know, part of the problem uh, I've always thought is that it makes sense to make a deal with Bangladesh that would essentially allow somehow our traffic to pay for that access. Now, you know, they don't have toll roads inside. And from their point of view, uh, giving us access just means crowding up whatever roads they've got. But if, you, if we had a system where uh, for the initial access on both sides the road is tolled, then we would be sharing, we would, our side either to the northeast or from the northeast would be saving a lot of uh, resources instead of going around the whole country. And some of that could go to Bangladesh in the form of tolls. That would, in fact, improve connectivity very substantially. Uh, and I think that would help. Some stuff is being done through the, I remember we had a program going to Myanmar, Myanmar and then uh, Sitwe port, and that was also underway. But that's only one, one link. We need to have much. Look, in the rest of the world, uh, seamless connectivity across countries is the name of the game. And I think we should do the same uh, in, uh, in this part of the world also. Uh, thank you, sir. We, uh, we have, we are on a video link with the JIS group. This is a group that runs educational institutions. Mm -hmm. And we are, on a, we are on a video link with them. And we have uh, agreed that we will permit them to, their, their students are watching you. They've been watching this program. And they would, they've been uh, permitted two questions. If you permit, I'll take them. Oh, absolutely, of course. OK, Shorajit. Hello. Hello. We see you. We see you. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. You you wish what? to you wish to ask a question? Can you hear me? <laughs> Do you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we'll have Not to give working? That up. We'll have to give that up. Yeah, there, there was a gentleman here who was wanting to ask a question. Where do you go? <coughs> no, 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 no. There was a gentleman here. He's moved out. Go ahead. Do you have a microphone? <laughs> My name is Shaveh Datta. I am a retired uh, person from the... Uh, Hello. Uh, just a moment. Hang on, I think the video links come live. Can you... Do you hear, do you hear us now? Can you hear us now? How would you hear us? Yeah? He's got his headphones off. Where exactly are they? Uh, I, I, do you hear us? Can you hear us? Can, can you hear us? No, I, I think we better disconnect that. Hello? Hmm. Hello? Disconnect that, please, because on the telephone, he's talking on the telephone. We don't connect. Yeah, go ahead. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Shabir Datta. I have been mainly in the Tata Steel group of companies and and I retired from there quite some time ago. Now, one point I feel uh, very often in, the, in our discussions we don't talk about is the growth rate of agriculture. We are an agricultural nation. 60 or more than that are occupied in agriculture and 
we think in terms of growth of agriculture of 1 to 1.5 percent. When we are talking about 10 percent growth, the agriculture's contribution is 1.5 or so. That is the productivity of 60 percent of our people. How can we remove poverty if that continues? That's a very, it, very good point. Uh, I want to say something more. Okay. We haven't really driven this point in our planned programs right from the from first five-year plan. Till today, the agricultural sector has been ignored. We always talked about industry, service industry, manufacturing industry, processing industry, but we d never talk about agriculture, which is the reason why we have about 60 to 70 percent of our people who need money to subsist. No, uh, <clears throat> first I'm, I must thank you for drawing attention to the agriculture issue. Uh, and I don't have, I don't totally agree with what you're saying, but I agree with a lot of what you're saying. So let me uh, make my points very uh, structured. Uh, number one, uh, first of all, just factual. You know, agriculture is now, when you say we are an agricultural nation, agriculture only provides about 17, 16, 17 percent of our GDP. Okay, no, and you said 60 percent, actually, uh, 51 percent of the population relies upon agriculture for the majority of their income. So it's not true that 60 percent is producing 17 percent. A large part of 51 percent, I don't know how large, is producing only 17 percent. So the point, the point you make is valid, but maybe the numbers you're using uh, give a slightly exaggerated picture. Now having said that, where you are, in my view, 100 percent correct is that 1.5 percent growth is absurd. The plan targets consistently have said 4 percent. In the 11th plan, we achieved about 3.6, which was an improvement over the previous period. I think in the last two or three years, it has come down below 2 percent. I'm not making this into a political point because it's also true that the weather hasn't been good. But two, three years, I mean, below 2 percent is clearly bad, okay? We, many people would say that if we were really determined, we could do 5 percent for Indian agriculture because our productivity levels are actually about half of what they should be given our conditions. But to achieve that change, you need a completely different approach to how we do farming. And one of the things we have to do, this is a good example of productivity, by the way. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is to glorify the traditional knowledge of our farmers. We should glorify the traditional commitment to working the land, that's true. But most of them have to forget what they know and learn from the agricultural scientists what is necessary in order to be more productive. Most important of all is water productivity. I mean, 80% of the water in the country is used for agriculture, and you don't need more than 40% to actually do the production we're doing, providing we were to use this water rationally. Now, that Unfortunately, there are too many things in policy that actually prevent uh, this movement towards more rational water use, charging for canal water, getting rid of free power for farmers, introducing some way of making sure that you don't have excessive growl of groundwater. It's a very, very complex issue. In addition to that, we need a total modernization of marketing. The only marketing we have successfully done is through the FCI, which is a hopelessly inefficient organization, and it serves the Punjab and Haryana farmers very well, because they just bring their wheat, dump it there, the FCI picks it up and distributes it to the rest of the country. The truth is that Punjab should not be growing any rice at all, because we're just killing the water balance of Punjab by growing rice. Unfortunately, 
we've made the Punjabis feel very proud that they are providing rice which is then taken to UP and uh, Bihar. And somebody, one of the agronomists in uh, Punjab translated that into water. So what we've got is a water scarce part of the country like Punjab exporting water to a water surplus part of the country like East UP and Bihar. Uh, so I agree with you that we need a total revamp uh, and I would say that the only things we've done which are good, one is we've, for the last 10 years, we've been doing this rural road uh, program which gives a lot of access to farmers and improves marketing. That's good. I think our agricultural effort has been actually disappointing. Now, somebody's got to get up and say so. Because, uh, you know, uh, lots of papers are written, lots of varieties are produced, but they're not varieties that are leading to an improvement in yield on the ground after the original success of the Green Revolution and whatever. One good thing we've done outside grain is we've brought in the private sector and seed development in all the other horticultural crops. That has led to some good stuff. We are completely confused on uh, GM crops in the sense that previous government ran into a problem. My good friend Jairam Ramesh put a stop. Present government seems to have the same problem. We are not very clear. I mean, the, both governments said that we are in favor of genetically modified crop providing it's subject to safety testing. Factual position on the ground is that there's immense resistance and we don't know. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> after a while, nobody will do research in GM crops if you're not sure that it's actually going to be cleared. So that's a serious problem uh, that we face over there. And finally, I think on marketing, all governments have said that the Agricultural Produce and Marketing uh, Committees Act is extremely negative. You should open up agricultural marketing, allow people to buy directly from a farm. Any state government can do it. And the previous government had passed a model law that allowed state governments, encouraged state governments to do that. No state government, I think one or two have. But by and large, state governments have ignored that. So I think I share your view that uh, our performance there is bad. However, I don't think the solution is going to come for, for poverty from agriculture in the sense that, you know, if the country grows at 7.5% and the population is growing a little below 1.5%, then the average productivity per person worked is growing at 6%. Now, even if agriculture grows at 6%, Productivity in agriculture is much lower than in urban non-agriculture. But for that productivity to grow by 6% with a 4% growth in production, employment in agriculture has to fall by 2% per year. So actually the solution to poverty is only going to come if we remove the pressure of labor on land and absorb them in industry. Then real wages will go up in agriculture and people will sort of move to a high productivity farm. The present position is 49% of farmers, according to the NSS, want to leave farming. So, and they're not going to change their mind if you increase the growth rate by 1% or 2%. I think there's a, we're facing a real crisis there that we must provide alternative opportunities which will be non-agricultural. Which China did superbly. So I hope, I thank you for making me focus on agriculture. I hope you don't mind where I disagree with you. But I think I agree with the substance of a lot of what you said. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take just two questions. Sir, on this point, this, this uh, statistics in the, uh, the report in the Times of India yesterday about 15% about more people looking for jobs in the rural areas from the employment guarantee scheme would tell you that they straight away that there is a there is a demand for shifting sure, away. Sure, sure. I mean, the no, no, that but there's been a drought, so you know there has the been a, demand for Narega would go up. Two years, yeah, uh, yes, that's true. That that's a fair point. Yeah, please you. Uh, in the link health field, I thought I'll put it. 
Sir, uh, Brigadier Balbir Singh, ex-Brigadier, I'm now with JS Group. Just wanted to know from your perspective, sir, you've been at a very, very high level. What do you uh, think are the main drivers in educational system or educational sector? And what is expected out of us, people like us, who are in the educational system? They are running uh, business schools as well as uh, engineering institutions. Mm -hmm. To be honest, you know, I, I, I'm not an exp I mean, other than knowing that education is important, uh, I know a lot of people who are expert in education, and I'm very aware that uh, they ideally would like me to say that I don't know enough about this, so I don't want to pronounce. I probably don't know enough about many things, but other people don't tell me to stop. So frankly, what we need to do in education is an important subject, but I think we need, uh, in fact, government needs to sit with educationists and talk to them. And, uh, we at the, and this is not a comment about the present situation. It's been there for the last 10 years. I think education policy is actually quite confused. When you're saying education, you mean primary education or all the way up higher education and everything? Higher education. Higher education, yeah. the higher education even more confused. Uh, because, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is we, I mean, I would encourage anyone who is in the private sector, if you're putting forth an educational program and you're getting students, you're doing a good job because you're almost certainly charging them much more than the private, than the public universities and you're not necessarily giving them scholarships. So if people are paying to get your education, you're delivering a service that they need. The really interesting question is that what are the public universities doing that are providing these degrees virtually free and clearly people are voting with their feet to get out. I think the problem with what, uh, with the sort of private education we've got is it's only in the areas which are directly linked to the job market, the technical education, business education and so on. There, there's a lot of this coming up. I think we need, a, we need to ask ourselves for our public system that, you know, we are now amongst the Indian, amongst the Asian developing countries, we are second really only to China in terms of uh, technical sophistication. Uh, but uh, we cannot say that our educational system uh, is anywhere near as much strengthened as the Chinese was. And frankly, the Chinese have just taken um, taking a big leaf out of the global book in uh, giving universities a lot more autonomy, bringing in professors if necessary from abroad, giving them more flexibility. I'm afraid we've bureaucratized our higher education system excessively. And uh, this, is, this has been true for the last 15 years. It's not, I'm not making a point of anything about the present uh, situation. And I think we do need some really serious rethink on this. Part of the problem, I must tell you, is that, you know, normally a sector gets reformed when there's pressure from within. There is no pressure from within the educational system for reform. I mean, the public sector universities, the, the teaching staff in the public sector universities, do not want any of the kind of reforms that would actually lead, according to global experts, uh, to a better educational system. And they're interested only in better salaries, which they probably do deserve. But you know, um, elsewhere in the world, things are handled quite differently. You know, frankly, I mean, I think that there's no reason why, I mean, if, if, if China has X number of universities in the top X hundred, we should have at least one third. Uh, we have only one, maybe two. So we're falling behind on that one. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take this as the last question. So my name is Malcolm Munsif. I'm a chartered accountant. I work with the Tata Group. So in the beginning part of your speech, of your talk today, you said that there wouldn't be much of a problem and we are expected to grow for the balance balanced few years, next few years, at a rate of about 7.5, 7.6, provided we do the right thing, yes. we are on the ball, <laughs> and we adopt the right strategies. 
But Mr. Arun Jaitley, when he came to power a few months after that, he said, even if the government is non-existent, if we do nothing, no policy, nothing, the growth rate would still continue. What, how would you react to that? The momentum of the Indian industry is such that growth rate would be automatic, a certain amount, may not be 7.6, maybe 7%. But if we do nothing, nothing right, nothing wrong, Still that ah, wait a minute. Continue. Nothing right and nothing wrong. Yeah, that's Mr. Jaitley said. The governments very rarely uh, adopt passive. Generally, either they do sensible things or they do silly things. So, you know, that kind of neutrality. Uh, I think what he had in mind was that, look, if we don't give any subsidies, if we don't give any tax breaks, but otherwise do our job, Industry will grow at some point. This I agree with. But, you know, what is the job of government in this situation? One, maintain macroeconomic balance. That's what I said right at the beginning. I think this gentleman raised the issue that one of the potential threats to macroeconomic balance is the banking system. Now, suppose Mr. Jetley says, if I do nothing in the banking system, we'll grow at 7%. I don't believe that. He will have a crisis sooner or later. So I think that... Uh, I put it this way that, you know, we should not, we should not judge a government by whether it does everything. Because, you know, at any given time, we are still a poor country. There are hundreds of things to do. So you can be sure that uh, in five years, whenever a government has five years, they're not going to be able to get everything done. But, you know, at any given time, governments should pick five or six things, and then they should say, look, I'm going to talk about everything. You know. This is a problem that when, I know when we used to write the plan, if we, if he said five things are important, ten people got up and said, you haven't mentioned my area, you don't think it's important. So we ended up having 50 things that are important, which really means nothing is important. So what governments say is separate. But in the back of their mind, what are the five things that they're going to say, this I'm going to get done? Now, people may have a different view, okay? Uh, but, you know, I think that reasonable people will agree on some very big issues. And that, I think, government has to do. I don't believe we will grow at 7.5% if we don't have significant progress in economic reforms in the areas on which there is a broad understanding and a broad consensus. I mean, take, take the PPP business, for example. We know what needs to be done. Even Mr. Jetley has said, you know, we must have better dispute resolution, this, that, and the other. Suppose you say we do nothing. That is, the projects that are stuck get stuck. There's no dispute resolution. What will happen is there'll be no new PPPs at all. There's a difference, by the way, between solving the problems of the PPPs that are stuck and creating a, pro a situation in which no new PPP will have a problem. Uh, ideally, you should do a fair bit of the first and all of the second. Okay. If you don't do anything, there'll be, the fellows that are stuck will be stuck, those banks will be stuck, there'll be no more PPPs, and your infrastructure investment will be half. Now to say that we are going to achieve 7.5% growth if my infrastructure investment is halved, I don't believe it. I don't think he meant that. You know, I mean, finance ministers in public have to say lots of things, and generally if you take Take it too literally and maybe not be being fair. Well, sir, thank you very much. This has been a very entertaining uh, uh, and a very illuminating uh, uh, lecture. We've, uh, we've, all of us have enjoyed this immensely. <laughs> Mr. Shrutanu goes, Mr. Shrutanu goes to sir. deliver the uh, formal vote of thanks. Dr. Aluwalia, sir, every conversation, every meeting, every interaction with you is so rewarding, so fulfilling, and so regaling that my English vocabulary is still doing its search engine, it's going around, but is yet to find any apt expressions, and it won't. The last time I had the pleasure of hearing you 
was I think last fall at a similar meet organized by another chamber. Again, it was an evening at the Taj Bengal. Uh, there I was sitting amidst uh, people over there and uh, I heard whisperings that the spirits are getting cold, uh, warm, and the food is getting cold. But then everybody condescended to allow that to happen. Today, sir, it's the Bengal chamber. I've heard no such rumors. <laughs> sir, the magnitude, the eclecticism of your erudition is uh, totally stupefying. Generally, when a person's erudition remains contained in his own domain, one that he has practiced, learnt, and thus has garnered the license to preach. Your erudition does not have any domain boundaries. Ladies and gentlemen, on that score, may I please request you to join me in according this vote of thanks to Dr. Aluwalia this evening and carry it through with total acclamation. I would now have the pleasure of uh, thanking wholeheartedly the following sponsors who have made this evening so memorable. Um, the GIS Group, the Ananda Bazaar Patrika, the Telegraph, our media partners, Shriram Properties, Limited Group, GS Marketing Associates, Calcutta Stock Exchange, Air India, Anderson Printing and Pernod Ricard India. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, for being with us this evening. May I now request uh, Mr. Taranjit Singh, sir, Managing Director, GIS Group and Chief Patron of the Bengal Chamber to please come up and please present a memento to Dr. Aluwalia. And may I at this juncture invite Mr. Anup Hoon, Chairperson of our Marketing and Brand Committee, to also come up to do his part of the honors. Our President Ambarish, Mr. Shunil Mitra, sir, thank you very much for organizing uh, this program this evening. And to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us in making this evening very memorable. Please do join us for some cocktails upset the Palladian Round. Thank you very much.
I was suggesting 8.15, sir.